Good afternoon. I'm Ellen McSherry, Chief Operating Officer at the NJCPA, and welcome to Issues Watch. Today I'm joined by Ralph Thomas, the CEO and Executive Director of the NJCPA. Ralph is on my far left. And sitting next to me is our current president, Kyle Sell. Kyle is a, is a partner with Deloitte. If you have a colleague who wasn't able to attend today, we'll be broadcasting this presentation on December 17th, 18th, and 19th. The December 17th presentation is at 9 p.m. to accommodate the busy workday schedules. And you'd be surprised at how many people have already registered for that particular session. If you have any questions at any point, instructions for submitting them are on the screen now and will be displayed periodically during the presentation. We will try to address questions submitted during the live presentation throughout the program. Questions submitted during a replay will be answered within 24 hours. During today's program, we will be covering many New Jersey issues, including pending legislation, a new program by the Division of Revenue, and a look at the state's economy and business environment. We will also discuss a number of national issues, trends, and regulations impacting the profession, and then provide updates on some of the key NJCPA programs, services, and initiatives. So we're going to kick it off with New Jersey issues, pass-through entity legislation. We've been talking about this really for close to a year now. And then Ralph is going to provide us an update as to where we are with it. Thank you, Ellen. Well, uh, actually today, the legislation is up in, in Trenton to be reviewed. Uh, I'll, I'll just step back a little bit. Um, for those who may not be aware of this, uh, it is a bill that will help small businesses uh, by letting them take the tax burden be at the entity level versus uh, the individual level. And the bill had gone through the legislature very quickly, and then all of a sudden it uh, went to the governor's team, and we had a whole bunch of amendments that kind of just changed the total landscape of the bill. And so for the last, you know, three, four weeks, we've been working with the, uh, the administration to understand their concerns and amendments, and I think we finally got, uh, you know, revised amendments that came out that I think we, and, and by we, our, our members who have been working uh, very closely on this, uh, Alan Sobel being mm -hmm. one, and Jim Evans as well on this, that we got to a point where they were okay with the, the amendments that were coming out. So today, it's going back to the legislature. We hope that it will go through, uh, because it is a bill that will really help small businesses and provide them somewhere between 200 million to 400 million uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, really important. I think if we're talking about how we turn New Jersey's economy around, that will be, be real, quit, uh, real quit, critical whoo, uh, to get that done today. <laughs> so keep your fingers crossed and uh, hopefully it will pass through. And then hopefully our goal is to get it signed by January 13th, which mm -hmm. is the last day for a legislative session in this session. And so we won't have to reintroduce it next year. Mm -hmm. So. That, that's great, Ralph. We'll continue to provide updates as, we, as they come. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hopefully, like you said, good news later today. Yeah. So on, the, on State Board regulations, we've been sharing information about updates to the Accountancy Act and the New Jersey State Board regs. So I know there's been some confusion regarding the A&A requirement. So we're going to show you a clip. It's a video with our NJCPA Chief Learning Officer, Jim Hardenberg, and NJCPA past president and member of State Board, Jack Daly. The rules and regulations that govern the accounting profession in New Jersey have gone through a much needed overhaul. In early 2019, changes to the Accountancy Act were signed by Governor Murphy, and more recently, the New Jersey State Board of Accountancy regulations were published and effective on September 3, 2019. And also remember, statutes are adopted by the legislature and signed into law by the governor, and the regulations of the board that effectuate those statutes are adopted by the Board of Accountancy. The statute has been amended to remove the CP requirement that mandates 24 credits in the areas of accounting and auditing for those in public practice. Please do not be misled by this change. The current regulations of the board still requires that 24 ANA credits be earned for those licensees engaged in public accountancy during the trennial period. The revised regulations include changes to the number of required CPE credits for technical subjects and other subjects. Yes, we still have the required 120 credits in total, but credit requirements have changed from the previous 72 credits for technical subjects to now 60 credits, and up to 56 credits for other subjects 
which was previ previously up to 44 credits. Notice I previously stated there is no change to the 24 accounting and auditing credit requirements for licensees engaged in public practice. So Jim and Jack provided a great overview, but I do want to just pass on some clarifications and some reminders. Uh, let's remember that the term public practice does include uh, those that are tax prep uh, individuals. So the state regs include tax preparation in the definition of public practice. Um, also, moving the requirements from the statutes into the regulations, I view as a positive step uh, forward and will provide for some additional uh, flexibility to hopefully, you know, influence some possible future changes or modifications. The ANA requirements historically have varied by state, and New Jersey has always marched to its own drummer, as we all know. Um, at a future Board of Trustees meeting, we are planning to discuss the ANA requirement um, and look to see what, what steps we can take. Thanks, Carl. And also, just to remember that 2020 is the last year of the triennial. So I'm going to ask Ralph to take us through the consensus revenue forecasting in independent contractor legislation. Wow. Uh, yes, that's uh, two um, interesting pieces of legislation that are, that are up. The um, Senate President Sweeney has proposed legislation that would create a three-person commission a task with reaching a consensus on revenue projections for the state's annual budget. As you know, it's always been a challenge to hone in on the revenue number there, so the sense is that this committee would do a, a, be a very objective body in terms of the revenue estimate. Uh, the society supports this bill. Um, uh, nearly 80% of the members responding to a survey we conducted last year said New Jersey should adopt a consensus forecasting uh, policy. Mm -hmm. um, Senator Sweeney proposed uh, legislation to prevent misclassification of workers, and this is to protect workers from being exploited in the growing gig economy. Mm -hmm. um, codify regulations to protect workers like freelancers. Uh, CPAs and certain other licensed professionals were exempted. And uh, in fact, when the bill was initially introduced, CPAs were the only group that were exempted. Uh, this bill is patterned a little bit after a bill in California, which had uh, almost 30 different organizations that were exempted. So the bill has cleared the Senate uh, Labor Committee and now heads to the full Senate for, for vote. Thanks, Ralph. A, a lot, especially for our practitioners to be advising their clients. Absolutely. Uh, this. Th this could have a significant impact because yeah. in today's environment, one of the ways that companies, you know, manage their bottom line is by having individuals that they call independent exactly. contractors. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, we're now going to move on to the Division of Reven uh, of Revenue has a brand new program. And Kyle's going to explain it to yep, us. Yep, just briefly on that. So we have the Streamlined Business Dissolution and Reinstatement Program. It's an amnesty-like program, so it's temporary in nature. Uh, businesses that are currently in revoked status can fully reinstate or officially dissolve through a single online filing. This program is going to run from March 1st till June 15th, and there is a one-time administrative fee of roughly $500. And further information will be available in February. Great. Thanks, Kyle. So you may have heard that Governor Murphy recently established a public bank implementation board to develop a plan for creating a public bank in New Jersey. In a recent episode of Issues Watch podcast, the NJ Spotlight reporter John Rettmeyer explained the pros and the cons of the arguments, and we're going to show you a portion of this video right now. The arguments that have been made for the public bank in New Jersey uh, rest on a couple different things. One of them is, you know, the reputation or faith in big commercial banks in the wake of the financial downturn of about a decade ago, and some of the high-profile um, uh, scandals or, or criminal cases or fraud cases that came, came out of that. So maybe a general distrust. And then you have this notion of the way that the banking system works presently, where we might, uh, as a state or even local governments, put taxpayer resources in a commercial bank, um, potentially a large one that uh, uses the resources to underwrite loans that New Jersey may have no control over, let alone be uh, directed towards some sort of benefit in New Jersey or in local communities here. So the idea that you bring our deposits home, use what 
New Jersey's putting into banks to underwrite activities that would be in the best interest of communities in New Jersey. Um, so that would be another reason. And then the, the other one would be that you have projects like affordable housing projects or infrastructure renewal projects or even student lending that uh, may not be getting uh, – may not take off or be profitable enough under their current banking model to get financing. And so what you would do is you would take projects that um, – you know, may not be, uh, or you know, may not be profitable for a bank or to 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 underwrite at this point, or that what they would the terms that they would give these projects may not be realistic for the government entities that are trying to advance them, and so you you bridge that gap a little bit. Um, so I think that those are some of the arguments we hear from the groups that are pushing for the public bank. Uh, some of the arguments that we hear against, uh, one of them is, you know, uh, creating a new bureaucracy. Does the state of New Jersey need a new bu bureaucracy, particularly one to get into the business of banking? Um, you know, uh, the political corruption issue I, I, has also been raised. Can New Jersey uh, politicians be trusted to run something like a bank? Uh, you know, I've in my years as a state house reporter, I've covered uh, arrests of lawmakers from both parties um, on various corruption charges. So it's it's not a you know it's not a theoretical. Um, and I think you know even the groups that are pushing for the public bank have raised questions more recently about potential issues coming out of the government's administration of economic development tax incentives. And so mm -hmm. that's another example of maybe well-meaning people trying to incentivize hiring to benefit the state economy. And we do have these concerns in an ongoing task force investigation that's um, looking at whether they were gamed. So, um, you know, I, you know, that's certainly uh, a valid concern to, to look at. Um, and then you hear from the banking community itself and they will make note that there is already a community reinvestment requirement in federal law. And so as part of their regular regulatory process, they, they have to do things like what we hear uh, are the goals of a potential public bank. We uh, recently polled our members about uh, this notion of a state bank and 85% uh, were opposed to the idea and only 10% supported. Some of the big concerns were uh, potential mismanagement, potential misuse of funds, um, and the other unnecessary. I think one of the other things that people uh, felt um, in, 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 in the comments too was we have an other issues that we need to deal with first and why create another new issue such as you know New Jersey's financial and economic health. So. Uh, uh, very interesting to see what will happen um, in the legislature, uh, whether they'll um, be, react positively to this and, and establish this commission. But I think the sentiment around that we're hearing from our other colleagues at other organizations that this is uh, something that we should you know, put to the side. Great. Thanks, Ralph. Um, we did have one question that came in on the CPE regs, and the question was, uh, when do the CPA regs actually go into effect? Well, they went into effect this past September, so yes. good information for all to know. Yep. Good. We're now going to move on to the New Jersey economy and the business environment, and I'm going to ask Kyle to kick that off. Sure. Thanks, Ellen. So we did a uh, member poll of our NJCPA ranks uh, recently around the business climate here in New Jersey. Um, so. From that poll, the results, uh, I would say, were less than favorable. We had about 64% of our members rated the environment as either fair or poor. 33% uh, rated it good, and only 3% rated it uh, as excellent. Uh, also, a, a recent survey that, that had just been issued by Duke University's Fuqua School of Business indicated that more than half of all finance chiefs expect the U.S. to be in a recession by the end of 2020. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. All right. You know, the Tax Foundation recently issued its 2020 Business Tax Climate Index, and as usual, New Jersey did not rate very well. Um, in a recent episode of Issues Watch podcast, the NJCPA Government Relations Vice President Jeff Kazerman discussed this with Rutgers economist Michael Lair. 
We have a short video to show you on a portion of that conversation. The Tax Foundation's latest uh, tax climate index for businesses, it just came out. And not surprisingly, New Jersey came in dead last. Uh, and I, I think they're always either last or amongst the, amongst the uh, three lowest in just about any tax-related poll. And the report says that the states in the bottom 10 tend to have a number of afflictions in common including complex non-neutral taxes with comparatively high rates. So just how bad or good are New Jersey's taxes compared to our neighboring states? Well, I, you know, you, just looking at gas tax for one, for example, New, New York and uh, Pennsylvania have higher ones. So in that vein, uh, we can't, complain too much, although those are two of the highest states in the union, so that's one of the issues. Uh, when it comes to property taxes, well, we have probably have a higher share of uh, our taxes in the form of property taxes, which are you know, somewhat regressive in a way. That is, you know, everybody, even renters, pay property tax through their rent. And so if, you know, if, if your rent is a larger portion of your income, which it tends to be, uh, it's it's not in a good direction. So we, you know, we'd rather not have it uh, in property taxes because the good times are bad. Uh, even this past recession, what happens is the you know municipalities have to budget, you know, balance their budget, so tax rates go up in bad times because they need to, you know, even when properties decline in value, that they increase the tax rate even higher, and they rarely come back down. Yeah, that well, <laughs> tax yeah. rates are hard to bring yep. back down. Yep, and so. This is one of the things. On the other hand, New Jerseyans, compared to other states, because we're a wealthy state, expect more from our public school districts. We want yep. to have the best schools. I mean, do you, do you live in West Windsor? Do you live in Princeton? Do you live in Morristown? Do you live in Moorestown? Do you, where, you know, do you live in Hatfield? If you don't live in those, you know, wow, geez, you know, you aren't well doing the best for your child. That's kind of the, the attitude in New Jersey. I didn't even know about quality of school districts when I was raised in Pennsylvania. Uh, so these are things that, you know, have become paramount and always have been in New Jersey. Well, that was interesting because, you know, there are some pros and cons to having high taxes. We do have, as he mentioned, very, very good schools. We have great reputation. Um, but there is that price you pay. Yeah, and I was just on a, a webcast recently with uh, some wealth management advisors that were sort of presenting the landscape of the tax situation, not just here in New Jersey, but across all 50 states. And it, it's, it's difficult to really, you know, understand why one would stay after retirement in the mm -hmm. state of New Jersey when you look at the cost, the right. cost of living that comes with that decision. But benefits prior to that. Mostly. Correct. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I think, too, the, the, the other thing that people are really going to focus on is whether the state really operates efficiently. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they think that I think there's some redundancy in a lot of areas. And they really are, I think, I think they're willing to pay higher taxes. But if this, the state does a better job of being more efficient at mm -hmm. what it's delivering, yeah. the goods and services that they're delivering to uh, New Jerseyans. Yeah. I think that's a key point. We did have a question that came in, but I think it's really more of a, 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 a very good suggestion by one of our members. Um, person wrote, why can't New Jersey simply incorporate a tax or surtax that would apply to all freelancers and self-employed Schedule C filers that would essentially collect the UIDI employer and employee taxes? So that's, I don't know if anyone's ever considered that or not, but that certainly is a suggestion. Right, and I would suggest our, our members, if they have other thoughts on, on, this, er on this area or any mm -hmm. area, that they um, send them in to us and also send them in to their their uh, legislators right. and and also to the governor. Right. I just reflect back to when we had the uh, the pass through legislation as a result of Alan Sobel writing a letter to the legislature, uh, the uh, the leaders in the legislature, and to the governor to talk about this opportunity. And that's why we're mm -hmm. here today, uh, again sitting with our fingers crossed that this yeah. will go through. Be, and and an idea that he had. So I encourage our members to you know 
think about, give some thought to some of the issues that we we're talking about today, and even uh, issues that maybe we haven't talked about to, you know, provide right. us with input on those suggestions, because it can yes, be helpful. Absolutely. You know, Kyle, you just referenced uh, um, the, the forum that you heard talking about all 50 states and, yeah. what, and what's happening in landscape. And, you know, it's interesting to see how New Jersey compares to its actual neighboring states. Um, Jeff Kauzman also talked with Michael Lohr a little bit about this, and we have a sh short clip on that also. How do we compare to uh, our neighboring states in the northeast? Well, I'd say compared to New York, we're not growing as fast, uh, we, but they tend to take care of their own just as well as New Jersey does. Uh, Connecticut, it's very similar to us, but a little bit behind on some things, probably growth-wise doing about the same. Pennsylvania may be growing slightly faster. On the other hand, it's a little bit more of a conservative state just because it's a little bit, you know, you, you have the eastern part, which may be more like uh, southern New Jersey, and then you have uh, what I call Pennsylvania, that part to the west, and, and Pittsburgh. Okay, so we're we're pretty even, maybe a little bit, a little bit slower, but nothing. We're that... slower, but we tend to be richer, and that's the main thing. And in fact, one of the things that causes some of that is that, you know, when we are really rich and wealthy, you know, we, we're we're a middle management state for the large part. So we have people come in, say from they come in, say uh, from overseas. They have, you know, New York's a gateway city. They come into New York. People come in there poor, and then the next stage they move out to the suburbs where their kids can go to good schools, and then they you know get a little bit wealthier or they retire and they move out of state. So we have this thing of we bring it. People who move into the state tend to be poorer than the people that move out of the state, and we tend to have a net loss of income in that game. Not because we have more people losing, just because the people who leave are that much richer than the people who come in. So Michael does present the case of what we've really known all along is the out-migration of the, the wealth is not matching what is coming in mm -hmm. for people moving in. And so we have a, obviously a shortage. Right. And, um, yeah, because the more, the more wealth is moving out than is coming in. Right. And so I think that well, many citizens don't focus on that, and also legislators too. And that's something right. that we've been you know, having discussions with uh, many of the legislators and then to take a look at the, the facts, the, the data. Yeah. And I think yeah. once they see that, they, you know, they kind of perk up and say, it's something, Maybe. we need to do something. Maybe. 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 <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so looking ahead, Michael also shared what he sees on the horizon for the next year or so. Depending upon the national economy, if the national economy, uh, uh, you know, we see a, a mild recession coming uh, over the course of the next year or so, most economists do and at the national level. There's some who are a little more sanguine, but uh, the large majority of the uh, people at the national level are saying, hey, we're going to see, uh, in general, unemployment rise, we're going to see uh, employment fall a little bit, and, uh, and a lot of this is due to drags from the federal economy. We have, you know, while we had a tax cut, which is a good thing, we've uh, not seen the expenditures fall at the federal level, and that's causing, as you may know, something on the order of a $1 trillion, uh, increase in deficit by $1 trillion a year. So this is, that indebtedness is overcoming, uh, the interest on that indebtedness is overcoming the benefits of the tax cut, and that's why the, we're seeing this likely tanking of the economy, national economy over the next year. And New Jersey is going to be part of that because a large part of our economy well, we, we're wealthier and we tend to invest a little bit more in the market. So if we lose some of our wealth in the market, that makes things a little tighter here. People pull in their, at least the people our age uh, who are converging on retirement may pull our belts in a little bit, move our assets away from the stock market into more fixed funds and that sort of thing. So that means we'll maybe put it into bonds or something else even uh, less uh, lucrative in the long run than that. So they, that's the kind of thing that we'll be seeing in general over the course of the next year. So we thank Michael and Jeff for giving us that information today. Yeah. Um, speaking of looking ahead, Ralph, what should we be keeping an eye on from a legislative standpoint in New Jersey? Well, as uh, we know, the budget. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. always a great topic. And uh, so that will be a, a big issue that we'll be, we'll be focused on. Uh, because, again, uh, the administration, the governor wants to introduce a, or lower the threshold on the millionaire's tax. And so that has been a hot issue that has 
Uh, actually, he's um, lost on in, in trying to get that through because uh, the leadership in the Senate and also in the Assembly uh, have not been in favor of, of dropping the, lo the level down to mm -hmm. a, a million, a million. So we'll see what happens there. I think uh, obviously the, the revenue projections are going to be important uh, because there's still there's a lot of talk about a, a recession coming on. And I think, too, um, there will be a lot of focus on the expense side uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what is, you know, what programs will maybe be cut or will more programs be introduced and then how do we fund them and, and pay for them. So I think that it's going to be an interesting discussion over the budget. I think uh, there will probably be some butting of heads yeah. like it was last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll just wait and see. And, and again, we're going to be, you know, focused on, on what's happening there and certainly hope to be in a position to provide input on that. Um, another big item that was uh, people thought may have gone through the, the legislative session this year was the adult use of cannabis. And that, uh, that seems to be headed for a ballot initiative in 2020 on the November um, the ballot. In fact, um, Senator Scutari will uh, put, it's putting together a, um, a mem uh, <coughs> excuse me, a budget measure that would leave the decision on uh, recreational legalization of recreational marijuana to the New Jersey voters. So we can expect that that would be something also that would be hmm. uh, considered on, on in a ballot initiative uh, in those hearings today. So I think all in all, those are the major issues. Again, the whole issue around the unfunded pension liability, uh, nothing has really been done in, in the two years uh, with, uh, with Governor Murphy to try to address that issue. And I think uh, people are waiting to see. That's, quote, the big elephant in the room that we haven't dealt with. So, and I think how it gets dealt with will have an impact on um, what comes through in the budget. Yeah, Ralph, and I just think overall from what I, I hear when I'm out with my clients, uncertainty is by far the biggest issue. There is just right. so much uncertainty in the political and in the yeah. economic environment right now, and, and it makes it very difficult to make decisions mm -hmm. and really think forward as to, you know, appropriate next steps. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, last year um, Senator Sweeney introduced 27 bills from the Path to Progress report. Um, Many of them have not been moved or whatever, so I think this year, this new session will be an opportunity to see some of those uh, getting through. And we had a number of things that we had in, such as um, Section 1202 um, mm -hmm. and things that would help the small business community. So uh, this, this will be, I think, a very yeah. interesting year to see um, because I think people, the, in particular the small business community, I think is poised to have something done on their behalf that will uh, encourage them to expand their footprint here, stay it's here, key. stay here yeah. is a real critical thing, yeah. it's key, uh, because when you look back on the current administration, nothing's really been done for the small business right. community. So I think that should be a big priority of the administration and certainly one, uh, something that we've been pushing as we have our discussions with lawmakers. Right. Yep. Well, thanks, Ralph. Yep. So we're going to move on to national issues now and the CPE, C I'm sorry, the CPA evolution. Mm -hmm. So you may ask, what is that? It's a combined NASBA AICPA initiative aimed at evolving the CPA licensure to reflect the skills and knowledge that CPAs increasingly need in a technology-driven marketplace. So you may ask, why is this needed? Right, so I'll talk a little bit about that. You teed me up nicely, Ellen. Thank you. <laughs> um, really, really, it comes down to demand, right? Employers are demanding uh, that their new hires have the appropriate level of skills and training. Uh, we're seeing firms hiring few accounting graduates, fewer I should say, uh, and then coupling that with more non-accounting graduates. So the hiring trends are shifting. Technology, as we all know, is impacting how we do our jobs and we need to adapt quickly as a profession or we'll, we'll become stale very quickly. Um, so expertise in technology and, and analytics will be essential. And to sustain the profession and to protect the public, we need to rethink how CPA licensure works. So um, what, is, what are we hearing in the marketplace? Uh, certainly there's been concern by members as to does this mean sort of a bifurcation of the CPA credential? And I'm happy to say as a result of the meetings we had at, at Fall Council that we learned that 
there is not going to be a bifurcation of the CPA credential. Mm -hmm. What is going to be, uh, AICPA and NASWA are working hand in glove to focus on a core that includes accounting, auditing, uh, or tax, and technology. Right. As Kyle alluded to, that's what uh, companies and firms are requiring now with uh, uh, this big slant move to technology that uh, individuals come out with those expertise. So, that being said, uh, the AICPA and NASBA are working and looking at the exam and seeing what can be done to the, with the exam to make sure that those skill sets and competencies are tested. And, um, and also, it's also uh, there to, you know, hope bolster the credential as well. Mm -hmm. Because there was a concern that would you have a, a split off um, into the technology area. And so, by providing an opportunity for individuals to get a CPA, but also to, you know, have those technology skills, I think that's going to be extremely helpful because it's going to be so important. Um, yeah, and as you admit, firms are going to be hiring fewer accounting grads, but mm -hmm. I want our members to be okay that they won't, they'll, they'll still be hiring people. Right. Uh, they will be just hiring people with different competencies. So one of the challenges that <coughs> we will have is, is working with academia to ensure that they're on the forefront of making sure that they're graduating individuals mm -hmm. that have those competencies that are necessary. So it's going to be interesting, you know, the body of knowledge and complexity for newly licensed CPAs is growing compared to 1990. Uh, just to give you some perspective, three times as many pages in the Internal Revenue Code, uh, mm -hmm. four times as many accounting standards, and five times as many auditing standards. So a lot of change is going on. So uh, I think it's going to be interesting. I think one of the things, too, is, you know, with not only the students that are coming out, but in individuals that are currently in their careers are uh, going to go through a process of unlearn and relearn uh, right. so that they can uh, be competent and address the needs of their clients and, 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 and customers as well. It's a lot to digest. Like and this. Yeah, it really is. And just to give a little bit of a, a look under the covers as well in terms of a possible model that NASBA and the AICPA are are thinking about. So they're evaluating feedback. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of outreach around the variety of licensure models that might be possible or considered. And, and one model that, that's being uh, evaluated currently really kind of analogizes well to that of a professional engineer. So every candidate would have to pass the same core, uh, as Ralph had talked about just a moment ago, audit, tax, technology, and accounting, right? Mm -hmm. That would be sort of the core. Um, and then you would basically choose one discipline. And the disciplines themselves have not yet been finalized. But there are three that have been identified so far. So that would be business reporting and analysis, information systems and controls, uh, and then tax compliance and planning. Thanks, Kyle. You know, so what are the next steps? They're going to continue to build out the model and continue to seek feedback. They're going to continue dialogue through at least mid-2020, and the goal is to finalize the model sometime in the summer of 2020. Then there'll be a plan and a map out of implementation. And if you wish to provide any feedback at all to the AICPA on this particular initiative, please do so mm -hmm. by emailing them at feedback at evolution, evolution of CF cpa.org. We'll get you out there. That's a mouthful. Yeah, there's there's a mouthful. Sorry. <laughs> Whoa. Um, so the accounting today, moving on to a different topic now, accounting today recently released their 2020 year ahead survey of CPA firms. And they did this from firms across the country. Mm -hmm. so Kyle, in your opinion, what did, what did you find most interesting about these findings? Yeah, there were some definitely some interesting findings. So 24% of the firms that were surveyed anticipate that they will grow 10% or more in 2020. 19% uh, of firms anticipate that they'll grow somewhere in the 6 to 9% range. The percentage of small firms uh, that are concerned, their concern is really about keeping up with technology, so that level of concern has increased significantly from last year's survey to this year's survey, so 29% last year versus 42% having that concern this year. Uh, we're also hearing similar uh, facts and, and, and uh, viewpoints from those here uh, in the state of New Jersey. Uh, relative to the tax season, there certainly appears to be less pessimism mm -hmm. around the 2020 tax season. Uh, only 5% think it will be worse than last year versus 24% uh, who expected that in the last survey that it would be you know, a very difficult and challenging right. season. Right. Thanks, Kyle. And speaking of tax, Ralph, why don't you take us through what you've seen on the tax side right now? 
Well, there's still the, the topic of the cap on property taxes, mm -hmm. which has been a, a huge item for uh, New Jersey. And so on the salt. On mm -hmm. salt, yes. And so uh, we continue in the looking at opportunities to maybe work around for that. Um, IRS continues to come out with saying you can't do that work around. Mm -hmm. So um, Congressman Gottheimer is still working to try to get something through in Washington. Uh, in fact, he just had a press conference in the latter part of November uh, talking about SALT and in particular he represents Bergen County and a number of the counties and he's in the 5th district and the average property tax in Bergen County is $24,000. So you can imagine that his constituents are a little bit upset about a $10,000 yeah. cap. So we're continuing to push forward on that. You know, again, I, I go back to, you know, what we have we're going on in the legislature today to try to see how we can provide some relief in that regard. Um, but I, I think it's going to be uh, challenging. Uh, it will, something will probably get through Congress, but then when it goes over to the Senate side, it probably will either, probably die on that side because of the, the fact that Republicans have the, the majority in, 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 in the, on the Senate side. So we'll just stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're still not getting, you know, uh, giving up on this. So a um, couple other things that, you know, have updated rules for using optional standard mileage rates and, and computing deductible costs of using a vehicle for business, charitable, medical, or moving expense purposes. Updated rules for using per diem rates for business travel. Taxpayers can use per diem rates or, or actual expenses. Uh, final regs uh, confirm that individuals taking advantage of increased gift and exclusion amounts in effect from 2018 to 2025 20, will not be adversely impacted after 2025 when exclusion amounts drop to the pre-2018 levels. Final regs issued on the foreign tax credit allows individuals and businesses to claim credit for taxes paid or accrued to foreign governments. And so we've just got a lot going on here uh, that's going to be interesting. But I, uh, I, the good thing is that we're staying on top of these things so that we can make sure that we get information out to our members. I challenge members <laughs> to always check our website so that we uh, to see what we've been posting out there on these various issues. And again, I just revert back. If you've got a great idea, if, a mem if members have great ideas, shoot them to us, okay. shoot them to your legislators. They uh, are very uh, welcoming to get ideas and thoughts and what they want to hear from their constituents. So, Thanks, Ralph. Yeah, and Ralph covered a lot of topics, uh, but we also have other I IRS news to uh, share with you. Um, so there is new guidance out on tax treatment of virtual currencies. Um, so virtual currency, from a, a federal point of view, is considered property uh, for federal tax purposes. And so they've now added a new question on Form 1040, Schedule 1, uh, which basically says or asks, at any time during 2019, did you receive, sell, send, exchange, or otherwise acquire any virtual currency? The IRS is also beginning to visit taxpayers who have compliance issues. Uh, the IRS will focus on areas where there have been limited, a limited number of revenue officers available due to declining resources. Also, be sure to get ready for this year's tax season. Don't forget to renew your P-10 with the IRS by December 31st. Make sure to review your e-services account for accuracy. Update your powers of attorney and third-party authorization records. And also make sure you have written security plans as required by the FTC. That's great. That's always a lot. Thank you, Carl. It's a lot. Good luck remembering all that, too. It's a lot. <laughs> so we're going to move on to a topic near and dear to your heart. Near and dear FASB. to my heart. We love the FASB. FASB. As, a, as an auditor by trade, um, spent, who's spent now 27 years yeah. in the wonderful world of FASB uh, rules and regulations, we do have uh, some updates for you. Um, so the FASB has delayed the implementation date of several standards. Uh, so this would include leases, accounting for credit losses, hedging, very exciting topic, uh, and then long duration insurance contracts. So the goal here is to provide companies with more time to implement these standards, especially given the complexities and challenges involved. And this is really focused on smaller public companies and, and then private and nonprofit organizations that have just recently worked through and have been digesting the new revenue recognition standard. But I would just throw out some caution around leases. Um, companies should not procrastinate uh, in working through this new standard. You cannot underestimate the amount of time and work that's involved. 
And not only just in identifying and evaluating all of your lease arrangements mm -hmm. and the potential for embedded leases, but when you think about project management, staffing, and technology, uh, the resources that are needed are, are you know, quite extensive. Um, and I would say from my client's point of view, the, the biggest challenge they're seeing now, and these are public companies that have just recently implemented the new lease standard, it, the implementation itself actually ended up going fairly smoothly. I think the bigger challenge has been sort of the ongoing maintenance and monitoring of your lease contracts, quarter in, quarter out, updates, modifications, cancel cancellations, new leases. Um, it, it is really quite an undertaking to sort of track and monitor. Absolutely. Thanks, Kyle. Yep. Appreciate See, you get, I get excited about I that. I know you so do. I know you very do. good stuff. <laughs> so we're, now we're going to move on to what's happening here at the NJCPA. We've been doing it. You may have heard a lot of work in the student loan debt area, and I'm going to ask Ralph to actually fill our members in as to where we are with that. Sure. This has been it's exciting. We have a, 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 a task force that has been formed uh, with our emerging leaders, taking uh, leadership in that, uh, on that task force. Mm -hmm. And they are going to be meeting with New Jersey's uh, Higher Education Secretary in January. Uh, the meeting was supposed to be in December. It got pushed mm -hmm. back. But, uh, you know, student debt, uh, loan debt is a, a big issue nationally. I think somewhere in the order of magnitude of $1.6 trillion, mm -hmm. if memory serves me correctly. And you know, thinking about, you know, a young person coming out today in New Jersey and having student debt 65, dollars 70000 or even as high as 180, 200,000, is incredible. You know, how do they get yeah. entrenched in, in a, right. with New Jersey being such a costly state? So they are going to be uh, meeting and having meeting with and, and working with Assemblyman Gary Scher, who's looking at put, putting the, uh, legislation to provide tax relief for student loan debt payments. So this is a, an exciting area. Uh, our young uh, leaders are, are, are very engaged in this, so it's, uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that we'll get some mm -hmm. good ideas that come out of that and move from something forward. There's some things that are being considered also on the national level right. in that regard, too, because it, it is a huge issue today is. for, for young people coming out of college. Absolutely. Thanks, Ralph. Well, we're excited to tell you about a new member benefit. It's called Jetpack Workflow. Members save on workflow management systems. It helps CPA firms manage deadlines without tasks falling through the cracks. They're also presenting a webinar in January. It's called Busy Season Benchmarks. How does your firm compare? And here's a preview. Hey there, David Costello, CEO of Jetpack Workflow here. And I'm really excited for this training that we're going to do for the NJCPA community. So this is our tax benchmark webinar. You're going to learn things like the benchmark for average turnaround time, for seasonal spike in workload, for average clients per team member, for how many returns a team member should be getting done every week, every month, every quarter. We're going to talk about those benchmarks. We're going to talk about 12 ways to improve those metrics if you're behind in your firm. Really excited to see you on the training. Click the link below and we'll see you soon. I hope you enjoyed that and it, you'll tune in and, and take advantage of that program. I think it's a, a a great benefit for the firms. Another benefit for the firms and actually for companies is something called Launchpad. It's a new site to help firms and businesses and college accounting students link up for internships. How great is that? Mm -hmm. um, we have a special offer today for Issues Watch viewers. A free 60-day internship posting for the first five firms to post using your code on your screen. I feel like I'm a, a, you know, a late-night TV promo here. Um, also, I want you to remember that we have the job bank. You can use the job bank to find temporary, part-time, or full-time staff, especially going into tax season, quite helpful. You can also save 20% on posting to the job bank now through January 15th using the code on your screen. We don't even want you to forget about our college scholarship program. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, dovetailing when you talk about um, student loan student debt, debt certainly is a way to help those students who have aspirations to become CPAs to help them with the cost, and the cost really is close to prohibitive right now. So applications for NJCPA scholarships for college students are due January 8th. The scholarships are $6,500 one-year scholarships for accounting students at New Jersey colleges currently in their junior or senior year entering in an accounting-related graduate program in New Jersey. Um, 
this is really exciting, I think. We've held our first ev ever CPA exam fee lottery in October. It was sponsored by Whitman, Whitman Business Advisors, who was one of our sponsors, and 10 winners received $750 vouchers to cover their CPA exam fees. Again, tremendous, tremendous benefit. We also have Find a CPA for those firms. This is, this is really a way to build traffic for your firms during busy season. If your firm enrolls in Find a CPA, you'll see the public goes on and actually Googles CPAs in their area, CPAs in level of different areas of expertise. So it's a great way to get exposure and obviously business. We don't want you to forget our NJCPA convention. So mark your calendar for that one. It's June 16th through 19th at the Brigada. We also want you to remember we have our property tax guide. New Jersey Homeowner's Guide for Property Taxes is a useful guide for all New Jersey homeowners to explain how property taxes are determined and where the money goes. So we do have um, some time for some questions that we had to come in. And let me pull them up here. So is the society doing anything to help New Jersey residents who have a second home in New York to stop from being forced to file as a New York resident? Hmm. I'm not sure. sure. I'm on that. Yeah, we'll have to um, throw that question to, to our, our state, uh, state tax, tax committee. Yeah. That, yeah. And, and which is another opportunity that if you have specific questions regarding state or federal, we have, I think our interest groups are the most valuable thing we have for our members. Sure, That's and the tax, the fed, fed tax and state tax are very engaged mm -hmm. right. um, with the uh, division of taxation here for the fed tax group and then also uh, with our members that are involved with, in the R, as advocates with the IRS as well. And what, they can post those on the open forum. Absolutely. On the those open forum. One thing I, I forgot to mention, Ellen, before uh, relative to our emerging leaders is that in, on the um, student debt issue, they actually have uh, a presentation that they have uh, delivered to parents about the pros and cons and some of the challenges hmm. as you think about, you know, incurring debt. So right. it's something if you've got uh, young people out there or you've got an organization, I think our young people would be more, our emerging leaders would be more than happy to go out and do presentations. They've done presentations yeah. before, so That's another good another good yeah. resource. Good so Rob, I think this, you might be able to help on this one. What is the probability of Section 4202 employee slash contractor becoming law in the next year? More likely than not? Well, I, 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 I think there, there's been a, a big push on it. Because obviously one of the things that the state feels is that they're missing some revenue opportunities and that individuals who are functioning as independent contractors are maybe out missing out on benefits. Um, so I think, you know, um, uh, it's, it's really 50-50 yeah. on there. Uh, there have been changes that have been made since it was introduced. I think the good thing is that, again, CPAs are excluded uh, in terms of that. But, you know, your clients are going to be impacted. Uh, about this issue as well. Mm -hmm. So we will continue to, uh, to press the flesh on this um, to try to make sure that the bills that come out are, have as minimal impact on New Jersey's economy as possible. Mm -hmm. But I, I, right. I'd be, I have to be honest that one of the thoughts was it provides additional revenue for the state by right. making a, an independent contractor an employer. Right. Employee, excuse me. Right. Somebody else here just made a comment that, again, a lot of these bills are killing small businesses. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's no question. Fortunately, though, I think, and you know, thus far, um, you know, we have good relationships both on the Senate side and also on the Assembly side, and um, the leadership on both of uh, those houses are focused on the impact on small business. If you go back to the Path to Progress report. A lot that was in the section on, on taxes was uh, trying to, you know, incentivize small businesses and, and right. give them something that they could be happy about. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and one last comment here, and, and I think this almost speaks to Opportunity New Jersey. Uh, should the NJCPA embark on a NJ, or New Jersey legislative re resolution similar to the AICPA's on the fiscal state of the nation? <laughs> the N New Jersey legislator ignores the fiscal health of the state and only focuses on its annual budget. Our primary government 
operations reflect a deficit in excess of $140 billion as of June 30th, 2018, and no one ever sees this, this particular Well, yeah, I think it, we, we have uh, pressed that button as well. Uh, I think in the path of progress, there was some, something uh, around that. But I think also in this uh, group that uh, Senator Sweeney wants on the, the consensus revenue, that's a start mm -hmm. uh, in terms of making sure that the revenue projections that are included in the state budget make sense and are doable. Right. Um, and again, you know, the goal is to try to get New Jersey out of the situation it's in. You know, we're always ranked 49th, 50th. Uh, the only thing that we're ranked number one is in out migration. <laughs> we need to stop that right. uh, as well. So, uh, yes, uh, we, we continue to focus on that and, um, and in terms of trying to get them to understand uh, some of the unintended consequences that, that mm -hmm. come about as a result of some of the, the public policy and legislation that they put forth. Right. Thanks, Ralph. So just to reiterate what I said at the beginning of the program, if you have a colleague who missed the program, we'll be playing it three times for CPE credit, December 17th at 9, that's p.m., <laughs> December 18th and 19th at 12 p.m. In the meantime, check njcpa.org, njcpa Pulse, and the open forum for updates on all the topics we discussed today and more. Remember to follow us on Twitter. So I just want... Um, Actually, Don is coming up to interrupt the broadcast. <laughs> hello. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello, Don. I have lines. All right. Uh, I just have to interrupt this broadcast. As you might know, those of you watching, uh, Ellen will be retiring from the NJCPA in May. So this will be her last Issues Watch broadcast. Um, she's been involved since the very beginning. Um, <laughs> this is actually your sweet 16th uh, broadcast. Wow. We've been doing this for over five years, and you will definitely be missed. Thank you. Thank you so, so sweet much. Sweet 16, and now she's being kissed. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, very nice. It's been my pleasure to moderate this, and couldn't have done it without you guys. Thank you. Yeah, we'll miss you. And actually, the, everybody who is in this particular room, you don't see what goes on behind the yeah, scenes. The folks that are behind amazing, the scenes. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Well, to close out this episode, please enjoy this short highlight video and happy, happy holidays. Happy, happy or holidays. Or happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ellen McSherry, Chief Operating Officer at the NJSCPA. Welcome to our first edition of Issues Watch with Ralph Thomas. Welcome to today's Issues Watch edition. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch with Ralph Thomas. Welcome to Issues Watch with Ralph Thomas. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen McSherry, as Don said. I'm Chief Operating Officer here at the NJCPA. And welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Welcome to Issues Watch. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen McSherry, Chief Operating Officer at the NJCPA. Welcome to Issues Watch. We look forward to seeing you at our next Issues Watch. Thanks. Have a great weekend. <laughs>